Welcome to Codex, a history of video games. I'm Mike Coletta. And I am Tyler Osby. And today, Tyler's going to take us through a little character called Sonic the Hedgehog. But first, I want to do a, a preface, an episode of preface. Ooh, that, that sounds scary. I know. I, just, I have a really bad cold right now, team listener. So if you hear weird noises and a sudden silence, it's because I'm muting my microphone. I just want to let everyone know that. I'm trying to save you from my coughing attacks. That's great. Everybody appreciates that. I'm trying yeah, not I, to catch a cold through the internet. Yeah, you know, it can happen. And I happen, think the listeners okay? also try not to catch a cold through the internet. Yeah, you know it can happen. So yep. everyone needs to be wary of that. Tyler, I'm excited to hear about Sonic the Hedgehog, though. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll kick it off here. Now, if there's one thing that gaming in the 90s, and the 90s just in general, uh, had no shortage of, it was mascot characters and attitude so i remember back in those days it seemed like every console had like the game for that system you know like the nes uh, always had super mario brothers and the super nintendo always had super mario world like you know like so th- and they were packaged with the console so everybody who bought that console had a copy of that game and everybody knew mario Did you ever go over to somebody's house and they had a super nintendo but they didn't have super mario world that was weird that was a weird experience yeah i didn't have Super Mario World. I'll talk about that. Is this Bizarro Land? What's happening? Yeah. How did we get here? I am the outlier in there. But in the late 80s and early 90s, Nintendo only had real one real competitor in this space, and it was Sega. Now, Sega had struggled for a few years with getting their mascot character. Uh, the ill-fated Master System had titles like Alex Kidd, and there was another one called Psycho Fox, which I had never heard of until I started researching mascot characters for Sega, and that sounds really scary. Um, Psycho but Nath- Fox sounds totally reasonable. I don't know what you're talking about. It sounds, <laughs> yeah. It's just a fox that has serious mental problems, and it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, Star Fox's weird brother, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> fox McClouds. He didn't make it in <laughs> pilot school, so they threw him in a sanitarium. Yeah. Uh, but a- Alex Kidd and Psycho Fox never managed to capture the public the way that Mario had. Mario had broad appeal. He appealed to kids with bright, colorful, and imaginative worlds that he ran and jumped through. And adults could have fun, too, because the games were just super good. And that was great. But Sega really struggled. Also, big positive press for mustaches. You know, really bringing those back in. He probably single-handedly made mustaches cool again. And overalls. And overalls, yep. My little brother wore overalls through his entire childhood, and it was probably because of Mario. He also would occasionally, if I recall, shoot fireballs from his hands, correct? Your brother? Yeah, my little brother. Yeah, it was, it kind of, it was a problem. We, several fires almost escalated out of control, but luckily we never had a true issue with it. But we, he did have to get that under control. Yeah. That's good. That's good stuff. Yeah. But Sega really struggled with their mascots during the 80s, even after the Genesis had been released. Um, it came packaged with a pretty good arcade conversion of Altered Beast, but that wasn't quite the system seller that Sega needed and that they had hoped for. They realized they were missing that mascot character with wide appeal to sell their systems, and so they set about searching for a replacement for Alex Kidd. They needed their answer to Mario. Real quick cut in here. Yeah. Uh, I had a buddy who remembers Sega and only really remembers Altered Beast. Like That was his like childhood game, which is cool. Wow. That's great. Because you know, Altered Beast doesn't get a lot of press, but it was a good game. People really yeah. liked it. So I just yeah, wanted to it, shout out to Sean so everyone it, knew that Sean knew that. It was a really good arcade conversion, too. Like back in the day, it was like, oh, there's the arcade version. And then there was like the, the Nintendo version or the Master System version. And, and that version was never very good. But with the Genesis, you started getting some arcade games that were pretty good, pretty similar. You yeah, know? port port quality was very important, I feel like, especially in this generation. We yeah. talked about it a lot. But like, yeah, because it was like, wasn't it like there was one system that had a Pac-Man port that was really bad? Yeah, the 2600. The, yeah, yeah. And then ColecoVision had the good one or yeah. something like that. Yeah, Coleco mm-hmm. had the good one. Same with Donkey Kong. Like the 2600 version of Donkey Kong was not great, but I think Coleco had a good one too. Oh, Coleco. How I miss you so much. The Connecticut Leather Company. Gosh, what a great, what a cool name. Yeah. So there were a few ideas pitched, including what was described on Wikipedia as, and this is true, a Theodore Roosevelt lookalike in pajamas. Do you ever wear your Theodore Roosevelt jam jams around the house? You know, I I, I keep them, but I I haven't been able to get rid of my Theodore Roosevelt pajamas, but I don't wear them very often anymore. It's really hard to go to sleep with a monocle in. I'll say that much. It's really difficult. 
yeah, it's it's pretty tough. And there's also like a big stick that comes with it too, um, which makes it hard to fall asleep. Though speaking softly makes it easier to fall asleep. Ooh. So anyway, uh, they they had a few other ma- animal mascots they were trying to. Oh, a side note: the Theodore Roosevelt lookalike in pajamas would eventually sort of form its way into becoming Doctor Robotnik. So they wouldn't just waste such a great uh, character idea. I they love wouldn't that. just get Recycle. rid of it. They would use it. Yeah. You got to recycle what you got. Good stuff. That's right. So they had a few few other animal, animal mascots. They had an armadillo. They had a rabbit. And most of these concepts can, would eventually find homes of some sort on the system. But the one that won all of the informal polls was a spiky teal hedgehog named Mr. Needlemouse. Um, so Naoto Oshimo is, the, uh, Oshimo is the guy that went to... New York, he, he was designing all these characters and he went to New York and he was like, would you like this Teddy Roosevelt guy? Would you like this rabbit guy? Would you like this armadillo guy? And, or would you like this hedgehog guy? And almost everybody was like, yeah, Mr. Needlemouse. I would love a game based on Mr. Needlemouse. And then I wish Teddy he was Roosevelt named Mr. came in second. Yeah, me too. Although, I don't know. I think Sonic is a pretty good name too. But Mr. Needlemouse is, it reminds me of like Mr. Peanut Butter from uh, BoJack Horseman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, far and away, people wanted Mr. Needlemouse. So Naoto Oshima pitched that to Sega as their mascot, and they decided to move forward. So Mr. Needlemouse was going to become a thing. Now, it was about this time in the early 90s when everything was about attitude. Generation X had grown disillusioned with the excess of the 80s that they weren't able to participate in, and the outlet for that rage was MTV and grunge music. These were the folks that had the NES as the kids, and they were on the cusp of outgrowing video games when outgrowing anything was a thing. I feel like people don't really outgrow things anymore. We just make them part of our identity and never, ever let them go. Um, I still That's a good have, point. Like, yeah, I still have like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle t-shirt, so, you know. I, I still have all my Legos from when I was a kid, so. Yep, yep. Um, so Sega didn't just need a mascot, but it needed somebody to, it needed something to bring these folks back into the fold. They didn't just want to keep making games for kids because those kids were starting to grow up. They wanted to make games that appealed to teens and young adults, too. So the funny thing about marketing towards kids is that if you can convince those kids that what your product is, is what their older siblings likes and uses, you can get a lot of those younger kids too, desperate to emulate their elders and show that they can be cool too. And it's not just a phase mom. So Sega had some work on their hands if they wanted this mascot to outdo Nintendo. Yep. Sonic's design was chosen for a few reasons. The shape was easy to draw, which made it not only easy to make the art for Sonic, the the video games and stuff like that, but it was also something kids could draw too, meaning that fridges across the world would be galleries for Sonic fan art. Uh, His blue was chosen to match Sega's logo, sort of subliminal way of like reinforcing and reminding you that you're playing a Sega product, kind of like how Mario's red is the same red that Nintendo uses in their logo. Um... He had super cool shoes that were inspired by Michael Jackson's 1987 album, Bad. Uh, If you look at the album cover for that, you can see the color that Bad is written in. Um, It's the same, kind of the same red that they used on his shoes and also the boots that he wore in that music video and like in promotions and stuff for for Bad was, is what Sonic's boots were like inspired by or his racing shoes. Um, Oh yeah, that's right. That's so awesome. Yeah, it's great because you can't forget that Michael Jackson was huge at this point in time. Uh, So this was like uh, a lot of people associate Michael Jackson with the 80s. But at at this point, the early 90s, he still had some pull. This was like pre-legal troubles, too. So almost anything that Michael touched turned to solid gold. So if you could associate Sonic even subtly with Jackson, uh, that's what they were going for. Plus, Sega actually had a pretty good relationship with Jackson at this point, having released Moonwalker on the Master System and the Genesis, and that was a fairly successful game. I think there was also an arcade port of it. Um, I could talk for a long time about There Michael definitely Jackson. is. Yeah, there's an arcade I, I port was, of Moonwalker. Yeah, I was at a... Uh, gosh, what's the name of it? I don't know. Um, there's a arcade bar in LA I was at and they definitely have a version of Moonwalker there and I was like what I got so excited (laughs) (laughs) I love that I want to play that um but uh but yeah so they had a decent a decent like sort of relationship going on with him I could talk a lot about Michael Jackson because I just read or I just listened to a book called uh Michael Jackson Inc on audible they are not a sponsor of the show but i just wanted to say that i read a book because i don't do that very often um hey you know what good for you man 
<laughs> but anyway, if you were associated with Michael Jackson in the early 90s, that was that was generally a pretty good thing for your product. Um, that would change later on and only a few years after this. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about that when we eventually get to Sonic 3, because Michael Jackson's legal troubles actually directly affect Sonic 3. So... Sonic's original design for the first games was also reminiscent of Mickey Mouse. Sega was really going for broke here. They wanted to make Sonic on the same level as Mickey Mouse, um, which is not a not an impossible thing to shoot for because there was at one point in the late 80s where Mario was more recognizable to children than Mickey Mouse was. So they wanted that same level of success. They were really going for Nintendo's throat here. They They saw that they had Mario and that Mario was a success, and they were like, we want that too, and we can get it. So, you know, go big or go home, right? They forgot to mention that after Disney found out that Mario was out beating Mickey, they're like, we got to put Mickey everywhere. There's no way we're going to be beaten out by a video game character. Yeah. Yeah. They 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 hit the gas on that, too. But uh, it was an interesting time. And uh, this was a good time to be putting together a mascot anyway. But now that they had a design, they needed a game to put him in. So fun fact, Sonic's first video game appearance was not in 1991's Sonic the Hedgehog, but in a lesser known game called Rad Mobile. It was a mediocre Rad racing Mobile. game. Yeah, it was a racing game that was not very great and would be totally forgotten now. It was like an arcade racing thing, um, except that it came out five months before Sonic the Hedgehog and it had Sonic as a little mirror ornament hanging from the rearview mirror in that game. So if you play that game, you see Sonic before the game ever came out, which is kind of neat. That's really cool. That's a cool Easter egg. Yeah, I like that kind of stuff. Um, there's a similar thing with uh, Banjo Kazooie. Banjo is in Diddy Kong Racing, um, like a couple what? of years before Banjo Kazooie ever came out. Yeah, and then there's other characters from Diddy Kong Racing that are also in the Banjo Kazooie games, like Tip Top, and I feel like there's a couple other ones. Um, also, Conker is in Diddy Kong Racing, and I don't think he had his own game until was Conker's Bad Fur Day the first Conker game. Might have been. Mm, I, don't know. I don't know. I never played them. Oh, it's great. I make it's, I make mistakes. That's what we learned. Yeah. Conker's Bad Fur Day is right up there with all of, you know, like that golden age of like 3D platformers on the N64. Conker's Bad Fur Day is right in there. Like it's top notch. Oh, man. But, Gotta check uh, it out. Yeah. Anyway, Sonic needed a game of his own if he was going to become as big of as Mario or Mickey Mouse, and all self-respecting mascots have their own games. Are they even a mascot if they don't have their own game? These are the questions. I don't think so. I don't think so at all. You no, definitely have your own game. Not. Yeah. I wanted to be Sega's mascot, and they're like, do you have a game? And I'm like, no. And they're like, you're out. Sorry. Yeah. You're out of the running. You don't stand a chance at being as big as Mickey Mouse. I try, but no. Yeah. Well, Maybe like Goofy. I'm on goofy yeah. level. You could have been goofy or Pluto. Oh, I love Pluto so much. I have a Pluto magnet. It's pretty great. Yeah, Pluto's weird in that universe because like Goofy can talk, and Pl- Pluto's a dog too. Like, what's going on there? That goes with the whole like Scooby Doo conundrum because Scooby can sometimes say like full sentences and sometimes not. Yeah, it's weird. I think sometimes I think that's just because Shaggy's on drugs. Yeah, I think so too. It could we be. really we really tore apart and really got into Scooby Doo today, and yeah. the whole gang. Yeah, we'll 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 come back to that someday. Uh, <laughs> they gotta have Scooby Doo video games. I'll look it up. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, part of Sega's brand in differentiating itself from Nintendo in the days of Genesis versus Super Nintendo was emphasizing that Sega's hardware was faster than Nintendo's hardware. This was especially true when the Genesis first came out because it was before the Super Nintendo and it handily outdid the NES in every single category. It was just straight up better in every sense of the word. But once the Super Nintendo came out and was the hot new thing on the block, Sega needed to make sure that the public knew that their hardware was fast because faster is better and I'm going to mix up some 80s movie catchphrase here is here and combine them and say speed is good nice i like that thanks you're a trendsetter thank you this was perfect because the software designer for sonic the hedgehog yuji naka was working on a system that would play similar to mario or, or a game that would play similar to mario but it would be much faster he had grown bored of mario's slow speeds in his games and wanted to make something that would get gamers adrenaline pumping He had tried a few different characters and designs for a game like this, but ultimately settled on a platformer that rewarded the player for being good at the game by giving them a ton of speed. If you've ever watched a pro speedrunner play a Sonic game, you know these games get going very fast, and it's super fun to watch. Uh, I'm going to watch that after it is tonight. I never thought to look up that. 
it's yeah, gonna be great. I, yeah, this game about speed never looked up speed runs. It's it's ironic because those you think those are the most be the most popular speed run games. You don't even think about it, really. Yeah, yeah, don't even think about it. But they're fun because they you they just get going so fast, and you can tell these people just have every like down to the millisecond these button timings. You know, it'd be an interesting episode, a history of speed running. That would in be games. an interesting episode. Put it on the list. Write, write that on the old list on the docket. Yep. All right. So the first game, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic's inaugural game was released on June 21st, 1991, after being revealed in January of the same year at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Uh, Contrary to how games in the 90s were usually released, the North American version of the game actually came out a month before the Japanese version released, which signaled that Sega was really trying to take over the American market with the game and that North America wasn't just an afterthought. Um... Lots of times in this time period, games would come out months or years earlier in Japan, but it was kind of uh, not not common for games to come out first in North America. So I, I thought that was pretty crazy. Now, yeah, it is interesting. Yeah. If you've never played a Sonic game, it's a side-scroller similar to the Mario series, only it's much faster. So as you learn the levels and the best way to traverse them, you're able to anticipate obstacles and go faster and faster. There's a lot of momentum that gets built up. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the actual gameplay because if you haven't played it, you really should just go play it. It's on almost literally everything out there. If you own a device with some buttons and even a lot of devices without buttons, like it's on phones, it's on Game Boy, it's on every console ever, probably. It just, there's no excuse to not check out Sonic the Hedgehog. It's a piece of gaming history. You should play it. Also, it's super fun. It's also the one that kind of got away from me. Did I tell you this? I don't think I've no. talked about this on the podcast. I don't I think have so. Almost beaten Sonic Two like six times. Like gotten all the way through the game, got to the final boss, and lose all my lives and can't beat it. Wow. Yeah, it happened. I was a kid, and it happened to me. I did it six times to try it out, and I just could never do it, and it made me so upset because I wanted to free all the, the adorable end. animals. Yeah. Wow. I just wanted to free the animals. Yeah. It was before internet, too, you know, so you're just doing it by learning. Okay. Yeah, you couldn't go and look it up. And even if you could, I feel like even if you had a strategy guide for Sonic, like that might speed up maybe the paths that you choose. But ultimately, you got to just get good, you know? You got to get good. You got to have that good strat going. And I just didn't have that. And, you know, yeah. I, I regret it to this day. And I tried to pick it up recently again. And I was like, gosh, I, I lost all of it. It's funny how yeah. you lose it. Yep. And you go, you just, you think back and you go, how did I ever clear this as a kid? Jeez. Yeah, I had no idea that it's that and like the only game I've stayed good at is Super Mario World. And that's because I've played it continuously throughout my life. Like it's yeah. just one of my favorite games in the world. So I'm always playing it. You just always come back to it. And the first two Sonic games were they didn't have any sort of save file system either. So it was just like, well, you lost all your lives. Like, tough luck. You back to the yeah, start. Back now. to the beginning. Yep. It was very yep. ruthless in that way. I had a because I had a Genesis instead of having a Super Nintendo. And so I played a lot of Sonic and a lot of really really weird third-party games that I try to look up now and I don't even remember the title, so I have to go off descriptions. Like, there was this <laughs> turn-based one I found recently. It's like turn-based soldiers where you, like, throw, like, a grenade and that's your move. Kind of like worms, almost, yeah. in a way. And I just, I couldn't find it. I gotta look it up. I gotta, I gotta look for it again. There, there's a good subreddit for that called Tip of My Joystick, like Tip of My Tongue, where you go oh, in there and you, like, describe good. this game from your childhood and somebody will go in there and be like, oh, it's this game. That's really awesome. I should post it on there just for fun, just to see. Yeah. All right. Sorry well, to interrupt. I got the original get really into it. Sonic the Hedgehog was incredibly well received. The gameplay was fluid. The graphics were bright, colorful, and awesome. And the music was written by a member of the J-pop band Dreams Come True. So the music was awesome too. Sega had a hit on their hands, and they knew it. So they decided to stop packaging the Genesis with Altered Beast and start packing in Sonic the Hedgehog to capitalize on the success. They sold so many Sonic the Hedgehog pack Genesis systems after that, and the game became synonymous with the Genesis and Sega themselves. Like I said, this was the game when we were talking about how the NES had Super Mario Brothers and the Super Nintendo had Super Mario World, and if you went over to someone's house and they didn't have those games, they were weirdos, and you're like, what are you, what are you even doing, right? Sonic yeah, was now that doing? game. It didn't come out as soon as the Genesis had came out, but it became that game that was just like, if you have Genesis and you don't have Sonic, what are you even doing? I didn't even know about Altered Beast being packaged with the Genesis until we did our original Genesis history. Yeah, like, I had always assumed for the longest time that Sonic was just a launch title for the me Genesis. Too. 
It no was idea. like three thought... years later that it came out. Gosh, I got a Genesis with Sonic in it too, for sure. Yeah. Um, side note here, I actually was that kid that didn't always have the game. I never owned Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo. I never owned Mario 64 for the Nintendo 64. Um, I never owned Mario Sunshine for the GameCube or Super Smash Bros. Melee. I feel like GameCube's game was like Smash Bros. Melee. Um, so in that way, I was kind of a bad gamer growing up. But I didn't really need to own those games because all my friends had them so I could just borrow it or play it at their house. Yeah, those games all were owned by my friends, too. Same boat with me. I don't know what happened to my Genesis. My mom swears she never got rid of it. It's It's gone gone. forever. It's gone forever. I think she got rid of it, and she's just too afraid to tell me, because I've brought it up to her at least once a year since I was in high school. She has no idea where it is. (laughs) Just gone. I I think it's just gone. I think I own three Genesis systems, because I bought... I went on Craigslist one time in, uh, in my hometown, and I was like... I wonder who's got Sega. I want to buy a Sega. And like, there's somebody who's like, I'm selling three Sega Genesis systems with like eight games. I was like, for like 20 bucks. Okay, cool. So I have like all these Sega Genesis systems now. I think only one of them works. That's cool though. I I, I think you could like, they're definitely fixable for sure. Yeah. I want to, I, I would like to dive in and figure out what exactly is wrong with them and see if I can get them to, to a lot of the times fix. it's just on the motherboard. Isn't it like one of the, like, I don't know what they're called. Technically, you just got to solder it back together, like re-solder the link between two. Mm. Yeah, that's what right, I've, well, I've, I've, I've watched. I, di- I deep dove into uh, some Xbox 360 modding videos for a while, and that was usually what they said. If it's a broken Xbox or Red Ring, you usually got to just re-solder a thing and re- re-hook it over this way. <laughs> all right. Well, I will. Uh, I'll check it out because the ones that are broken don't power on at all. But oh well, they're pa- yeah okay. Well, you know what? That's different. That's clearly different. I also I I love how I watched one Xbox 360 video and I'm like, oh, I know how all video game systems work. My name is Mike. (laughs) Uh, Yes, I can fix this Sega for sure. Mm, Yes, I'm the the definition of the internet right now. (laughs) Uh, Well, back to Sonic here. Uh, So while the Genesis was the main hardware platform that Sega was promoting at the time, it wasn't the only platform. They also had that battery guzzling Game Gear, and they were trying to differentiate that from the Game Boy. So even though most most of Sonic's marketing and appeal was based on its speed and how Genesis does what Nintendo don't, which is still one of the greatest like burn taglines of all time, um, the Game Gear still needed a flagship title. So why not do a version of Sonic for the Game Gear? And so they did. The 8-bit version of Sonic was released in December of the same year as the original game, so 1991. The idea was the same, but due to hardware constraints, the graphics were a lot simpler, the speed had to be toned down a lot. Um, So the game actually kind of changed its focus from being centered around memorization and speed and being more about exploring and and seeing everything that the level had to offer. So the story was the same, and it definitely feels like a faithful recreation of the original game in a handheld form factor. And anyway, it's not like you were playing anything better on your Game Gear. Can you name any other game for the Game Gear? Nope. Columns, maybe, which is what the Game Gear came with, which was I like don't their, even know what their Columns is. Yeah, it was like their ripoff of Tetris, and it was not very good. Um, Every system had a Tetris ripoff. It's amazing. Yep. So Sega Game Gear had no games, but it did have Sonic the Hedgehog and Columns. What was so cool about the Game Gear version of Sonic was that since the Game Gear's hardware was nearly identical to the Master System, Sega was also able to release a port of this game for the Master System. So even if you were still behind the times and had older hardware, you could still be like all the cool kids playing Sonic in their leather jackets and listening to cassette tapes of Michael Jackson's Bad Album and probably, I don't know, smoking cigarettes or something. I wasn't cool in the 90s, so I don't know what the cool kids were doing. But if you had a Master System, you could still play Sonic like the cool kids. And I think that's neat. I think that's just great. I think I like... you were the cool kid, and you just don't know it, Tyler. Oh, thanks, Mike. You just t- put that cigarette away, grab a Tamagotchi. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Actually, yep. I, had, I, had, I had a Digipet. Full, full disclosure to everybody. I had a Digipet. Oh, no, a Gigapet. Sorry. Gigapet. I had a Gigapet also. My Gigapet was the frog. I had the dog one. I had a buddy that just bought that Frog Gigapet online, and I was like, dude, that's the exact same one I had as a kid. And he's like, what? No way. I'm like, yeah. Well, not the exact same one, but you know what I mean. But, pr- but pretty close, yeah. It I had hard. another one. I had a Nano Pet that had like 20 different pets in one, so when you reset it, you got to pick from a bunch of different pets. That's cool. I had one that was um, sponsored 
uh, for the 1994 Godzilla movie with Matthew Broderick. It was shaped like a Godzilla egg from the movie. I think it was 94. Wow. It might have been 97. Yeah, it was a good year. It was fun. <laughs> got to go clean up Godzilla's poop, you know, because that's yeah. what Godzilla's do. They, they poop a lot. And it's probably, oh, man, that's got to be a huge job. They're the worst job ever. You got to have a forklift for that. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, back to Sonic. Uh, <laughs> we just go on so many terrible <laughs> tangents so looking back i think that sonic the hedgehog had a huge impact on gaming as a whole and i don't think there's many people who would disagree with me on that but there was a whole trend of animals with attitude in video games like uh crash bandicoot and gex the gecko uh doing kind of the same thing that sonic was and they they would um at least in the the case of crash bandicoot they were directly inspired by sonic they're like we also wanted to do sonic um and even nintendo had had kind of a little bit of that going on with games like star fox because like fox mccloud was like this super cool badass fox who flew spaceships and stuff and falco was a blue and red falcon who was like he he was spicy like he would like make fun of you and stuff like that so and uh, usually all nintendo characters were like slippy before that moment they were all slippy before Sonic the Hedgehog came out, everybody was slippy on Nintendo. Yeah. That is accurate. <laughs> so, yeah, Sonic, to me, sort of epitomizes that late 80s, early 90s attitude era, uh, which is not to be confused with the late 90s WWF attitude era. Of, uh, this was like people trying to be edgy and cool, like before it was um, like like ironic or something to, to make fun of. You know what I mean? Like this is where that stuff really got started, and I think Sonic led the pack with that. Um, so these were the kids who were going to grow up loving edge lords like Sephiroth when Final Fantasy VII would come out, and I think it's a natural. He, I think like Sephiroth is sort of the natural extension of characters like this. Like, sure, Sonic was edgy, but he wasn't mature in a way that the kids of that decade would come to love. I don't know. I always find this era and time to be particularly interesting, uh, probably because I grew up during it, but I wasn't really able to participate because I was so young. Um, being, uh, I was born in 1990, so I was alive when Sonic came out, and I was definitely part of the zeitgeist growing up. Um, but I wasn't able to be that like edgy kid. So I just like looking at this era in time, um, video games like Sonic were like my gateway into that world. And they were a rare treat since I was a Nintendo kid growing up too. Sonic, I, they, the people across my uh, street from my house when I was like four or five years old, they had a Sega and they had Sonic and I would go over their house to play their Sega Genesis. That's awesome. I, I had yeah. a, a neighbor also who had a Sega Genesis, and they had a Sega Saturn too when they first came out, and that was Whoa. really cool. Yeah. So that Living was in neat. the future. Yeah, I want to get a Sega 32X and a Sega CD. I need more space because I want to have all these like old retro consoles set up, and I want to get like a cool CRT. Anyway, this is. I no, it's, this needs to be talked about. Actually, I was going to throw back to what you said a little earlier. You made a Gex the Gecko reference. Completely forgot about Gex. Oh, Loved yeah. Loved Gex so much. I had a Game Boy color game for Gex, the Gecko, I believe. Oh, yeah. He was kind of the mascot for, um, I want to say he was a Turbo Graphics. I mean, he, he was on a lot of other things, especially after Turbo Graphics died. Um, but Gex, the Gecko. Let's look this guy up. Gex, the Gecko. Gex, Enter the Gecko. That was the like Nintendo 64 one. Um, but the first Gex game was on 3DO. That's what it was. So he yeah, was kind had- of the mascot for 3DO. I had Gex Enter the Gecko for Game Boy Color. Big yeah, that fan. was like the big one because it came out on PlayStation N64 and Game Boy. And Color. it's again, it's a it's a platformer. Again, they're always platformers. These yep. like animal mascot games. Yeah, super Two into them though. Big things in the '90s: edgy mascot characters and platformers. Oh yeah, because I mean, who doesn't know? Like, you pick up a plat. That's like probably the easiest thing to pick up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, and it always makes sense. It's like, go to the right side of the screen, jump over the bad guys. You, It's pretty easy to like yep. be new at. Yep. It's yeah. so great. Platformers totally right. are just great in general. And they're, they still, and I feel like people that play video games a lot still love platformers as well as people that are new to video games, which makes me happy. Yeah. It's interesting that they don't make a whole lot of new platformers these days, but you're right. Like everybody still likes them and plays them. I guess nobody's willing to buy one because they, they have enough already. They're just like, well, I got Mario. I got Sonic. Trying to sell me yeah. something new because I got what enough. else? What else do I need? Yeah, Put it all down. I'm gonna look yep. up Game Boy Colors. Gosh, that's something I don't need to buy, but I want because I <laughs> told you how some I had a, I let my friend, my brother's friend, borrow my Game Boy Color and he just lost it. I never oh, saw it again. Just lost yeah. it. Who? Lo- how do you lose a Game Boy Color? Uh, I, I think there's foul play there. Yeah, I think there's some foul play too. It was a purple Game Boy Color and it was so fun. And he had my Mario Golf game with it that was really good, like the RPG one. Oh, oh that's man. cool. 
It was so cool. I have some games still for it. I have Heroes of Might and Magic 4, and then I have Pokemon Red, my original Pokemon Red cartridge I still have, which is nice. Good, because good, otherwise I would cry, you know? You got to have yeah. those ones. Well, sorry, as another far as, tangent. As far as Sonic goes, I think that's a good place to leave it for today. Uh, but next time, I want to cover more of the games themselves, like Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Sonic 3, Sonic and & Knuckles, and dig into some of the more modern 3D titles, too. Um, I think Sonic is a really interesting character because he retains his signature style, but he grows and evolves as time goes on in a way that I don't think characters like Mario do. Like, Mario, sure, the games change, they get more modern, but Mario himself is the same today as he was in 1985. Uh, and since cause it's because he was never really trying to capture any particular like moment in time or zeitgeist, like he was never jumping on trends. Like Sonic was definitely jumping on the edgy and cool trend of the early '90s, and so he has to evolve as like trends move away from stuff like that, um, which I think is really interesting. And I think Sonic is he doesn't always have the best games these days, but his evolution as a character and and since he hasn't been quite as successful as Mario, like everything Mario is in is just gold. So they don't feel like they need to change a whole lot, but Sonic hasn't been that way. And so they've had to change him a lot over time. And it's interesting to see like, Oh, what does Sega think Sonic is now? You know, well, isn't, isn't Mario also kind of a silent protagonist in almost all the games he's in? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're totally right. Uh, he, yeah, you're right. He doesn't really talk a, at all. He's got a voice, and he says he has a few little catchphrases, but over, overall, you're right. He doesn't say anything. Yeah. Hard to have some character there, because, they, again, they want all of us to feel like we're Mario. Yep. You know? Yep. But I want to be has, cool like Sonic. Yeah, he's got a little bit more character. He's he's more more of a uh, an entity unto himself. So next time, we'll dive into more of those games. We'll talk about Sonic's changes and attempts to grow with the times. Oh, we'll talk about his TV shows. He's had a whole bunch of TV shows, including two that ran at the same time. So I was going to say, I remember the animated show being a big deal yeah. as a kid. There's There was Sonic the Hedgehog, the animated show, and then there was Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. They ran at the same time, and in fact, they premiered at almost the exact same time, too. Um, and they were different. Like, they were the same... But they were very different. You know what I mean? Like they were both kind of trying to just be the Sonic show, but th- they had different characters. They had different storylines, and like it's just interesting to see these two shows about the same character, and neither of them they're not related in any way. You know? So anyway, really Mike, messing with the canon right there. Yeah, Mike, do you have any memories about Sonic that you want to share? Well, I mentioned playing it as a kid in, on Market Street in Fairbanks, Alaska, in the early '90s, but yeah, uh, also. I was super attached to these games because the speed was really cool, but also the whole idea behind it where the, all the animals are like trapped in robot bodies. So when you actually kill mm-hmm. something in quotes, you're really freeing the animal from its robot body. Oh yeah. I had forgot about that. You're right. You never really kill anything. You're just, no, you're just free. Your only person you were really trying to mess up is Dr. Robotnik, but he always moves away to the next thing, you know, he to the next stage. You know, yeah. at least in Sonic. Sonic 2 is the one I played the most. Okay. And that's what I always liked about Sonic. But I also really liked Knuckles as a character. You know, I thought that was because Knuckles was even like more cool than Sonic. And you're like, how can you be more cool than Sonic? This is crazy. You yeah, know, Knuckles it was definitely more cool than Sonic. And also uh, Shadow the Hedgehog from Sonic Adventure 2. He was like way cooler than Sonic. Oh, yeah. My favorite, though that I remember from those early Sonic games is they'd have like the crazy 3D running forward levels oh, in between. Yeah. Like the, they're the crystal stages. Is that what they're called? Yeah. Trying to something? get the chaos emeralds. The chaos emeralds. That's what they're called. Yeah. Those ones I remember a lot, but yeah, Mario, I, I mean, Sonic, cause Mario, Super Mario world was like a big part of me just cause that game is so fun, you know, traveling yeah. through, but Sonic was the one I spent more time with easily. Cause I, I didn't own Super Mario world. I'd only played at people's houses. But I own Sonic, and I spent way more time with Sonic, so it always has a special place in my heart, you know. Mm-hmm. Because I, I was a that. Sega, I was a Sega kid before I was a Nintendo kid. Like I got N sixty four as my first Nintendo system, except I had NESs, but they were always from like garage sales or like church auctions, you know. Yeah. So I yeah. never owned an actual like Mario game. Like I think I had the Dual Duck Hunt Mario thing, <laughs> but mm-hmm. that was at the same time we had like the Sega or whatever. So. Yeah, love oh, me that, some Sonic. That's a good cartridge. Is what I'm saying, love yeah. me some Sonic. Yeah, my so my much. Sonic. I didn't play very much Sonic in in the 90s. I watched a lot of people play Sonic. I definitely knew of it. I watched the TV show a little bit, 
um, when I was when I was a kid. But uh, my it was my neighbor that had a Sega, the cool neighbor with the Saturn. Um, and so I, I went over there sometimes and I played some games over there. Um, but, uh, my main Sonic memories are probably of the TV show mostly until the Dreamcast came out. And, uh, then I went over to my buddy's house and he showed me Sonic Adventure. And I remember, I think I've told this story on the podcast before it's I, when we talked about the Dreamcast, but I distinctly remember him talking about how, oh, we can't play the game yet because we have to watch all the movies first of like this storyline that like had unplayable parts that were telling the story and it was like just blowing my mind. Oh yeah. Sonic adventure was crazy. I never played those, but it looked really cool. It's not, they're not very good games. I mean, they were, they were for 1999 and like there are people who will tell you that they're good because they have fond memories of them, but they do not hold up at all. They, the voice acting is bad. The gameplay and camera is like bad and it's 1999. So like, we, we had had 3D platformers for a few years, and we had mostly figured out these camera issues, and Sonic didn't. Sonic Adventure 2 is kind of better. I don't know. We'll, we can talk about those, but yeah. they're, they're not, they weren't great games. They're on Xbox, though, if you want to check them out. Yeah, also, I'd look here, Sonic Adventure is also on Steam. Oh, yeah. I think that the PC cool. version is not good, also. I think it's, like, especially bad. That, doesn't, that, that definitely sounds about right. Yeah. I played Sonic Adventure a lot on the GameCube re- re-release. Ooh, that's cool. They re-released it, though. Yeah. Was that better? My buddy, my different buddy that had a Dreamcast, he got a Dreamcast with uh, Sonic Adventure, but he uh, his Sonic Adventure also had a second disc that w- was a demo for Sonic Adventure 2. This was before Sonic Adventure 2 was out. And so you could play the whole first level of Sonic Adventure 2, and that was very exciting because it has like a cool city snowboarding part, only it has no snow. You're just scraping the concrete i guess um with jumps and it's very fun just like real life you know yeah yep just like real life so anyway that's kind of what i've got to say about sonic today we can dig into the the games in the future i don't know if we want to do that next week or what but um we can kind of we can dig into that i have i have some ideas for what i want to do next week so i will i will i will i will come back and and let you know tyler but i won't let the listener know they're not going to know until next week it's a secret Ooh. I love it. What you been playing, Mike? Well, this week's been kind of funny because I have been playing so much Skyrim. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, back why. to 2011. I'm, I'm just in the mood and I'm just doing it and it's been really fun. So I, that's what I've it's been doing. It's a great doing. game. It is a great game. It's just really funny because, yeah, I'm like, I should be playing all these new things that come out, but it's like, one, I don't have the money to buy new games. I haven't got Borderlands 3 yet. It's driving me crazy because I see like everyone in my friends list playing it on Xbox. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, I, I just can't afford it. But I am like loving playing Skyrim again. It's so nice. I have like a, I never really used magic in those games. Mm-hmm. And I decided to make like a, a magic battle mage kind of with like a sword in one hand and I do spells in the other. And yeah. it has been so much fun just messing with the spells i'm like what was i doing this whole time playing like fighters spells are all the great. time so fun so fun big fan what have you been playing well i have i picked up borderlands 3 but i haven't fired it up yet i'll probably play that with kelly hopefully maybe we'll play that with you if you if you pick it up soonish yeah i'm hoping to pick it up next week i mean okay. I, I i i hope so we'll see i really well, want it well, we're in no rush, so we can we can wait for you. I played probably the first like fifteen minutes of Gears Five just because I wanted to see. I had heard online about all these like how well it runs and like how good it looks. So I just kind of wanted to get a feel for how good it looks, and how well it runs, and yeah, it looks great and runs great. So can confirm Gears Five is pretty sweet. Um, That's awesome. Last, last night I continued on my Splinter Cell um, binge that I started like almost two years ago I guess I was playing all of the Splinter Cell games but I'm on Conviction now and I played the first three missions of Conviction last night so I think I'm firmly committed now at this point it was on sale and it's it was like five bucks and it plays on the Xbox One so I was like I'm in this is all I need so I'll play that I played that and um, I played I played Final Fantasy 14 still just checking the boxes doing my dailies um two more weeks until i can get the super cool weapon if i do the raid every week so i'm i need i need seven clears of the raid and i've got five so that's exciting um and then in like two weeks destiny 2 shadow keep comes out 
Oh man, I forgot about Shadow Keep. I was actually going to talk to you about it. I was I played a little Destiny this week, and I'm in these spots with it where to unlock certain things, I have to do very annoying, minute challenges Oof. to keep going. Like for example, in the Lumina quest for the hand cannon, I have to kill an invader before they kill anyone else in the group, oh, and it is I'm, so annoying to yeah. do that. Those are, those are the kind of things that are annoying because, like, it'll eventually happen just sort of, like, because it can't not happen eventually. But, like, when you're trying for it, it feels like it takes forever. Yeah, and what's funny is I was playing like, my other character a week ago, and I did a gambit, and I did it. But it didn't count oh. because I was on my other character, and I was so mad. I'm like, of oh. course I do it when I'm playing on the Warlock and not the Titan. And so That's it's, I, I, Yeah, I looked it up because if I do that, I'm only one more step away to do it. And I was just like, "Come on, man! I just need to do this." Like, I because I'm yeah. just trying to get these other these older guns in the next couple of weeks because I'm like, I just want to get like Truth and Lumina and those uh, get my exotics cleared out. So I yeah, have them. I gotta do that too. Well, we're on a couple together, so we could do that together sometime this week or something. Those yeah, are fun. We should try. I, I wouldn't mind jumping back into some Destiny. Yeah, I'm traveling on the road this week, so I have a lot of free time during the day. You know what I mean? Great. So, yeah, it's it's good to be good, but. Um, yeah, I just, I was, I got a little frustrated earlier today. I was like, I just don't know why I'm playing this if I'm not having a good time. So I just shut it off because <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted that's... to progress, but I'm like, it's not worth making me frustrated Yep. with a game I really love. You know, I yeah. got the comics, you know? Yeah. And I, I haven't even read those yet. Did you know there's an emblem inside the comic book, by the way? Oh no, I didn't. I haven't unwrapped it yet. By the way, yeah, thank you, you get... for sending me that. Oh yeah, no worries. I, I I just was like, I saw that, and I'm like, Tyler needs. He loves comics now, and it's perfect. And I guess there's an emblem inside. You get an emblem for the game for buying cool. the comic book collection. So there, that's neat. All uh, right, but yeah, it, it, it's been a good week. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just like, yeah, throwback to 2011. I guess isn't that crazy that game's that old now? Yeah, that is crazy because I remember when it was brand new. I do, I do too. I was a year into stand up comedy, and Dang. I am nine years in now. Woof. I remember being at the Comedy Underground and comedians talking about it. Like, I don't like, oh, these are all the comedians that are not going to go do shows this week because they're all going to be hanging out in their houses playing Skyrim. <laughs> yeah. A bunch of nerds. And I never got it until much later. Like, I got yeah. it for Xbox 360 the first time when that special edition came out with all the DLCs. And I played it a ton then and I beat it then. And now I just got the special edition for Xbox One. And I'm like, I'm just feeling it again. It was like 20 bucks on sale. Like, yep. Well, you can play it's, it differently every time you play it. Like you said, you're doing the the magic stuff now, which is like a totally different way of playing. Oh, yeah. That was an assassin the first time. I feel like if you want to beat any Bethesda, like Elder Scrolls Fallout game, sneak and do a ranged weapon and you're going to yeah. win. Like that's the that's the secret to any Fallout or Elder Scrolls game. Yep. I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah. I but remember it, when that game came out was my senior year of college. Oh man, it's such a good. It's such a which good doesn't game. feel like it was that long ago, but I guess it definitely was a long time ago now because I'm old. The first time you fought a dragon in that game, just oh, it's so crazy because you think My about mind. it, you're like, there weren't a lot of games where you fought dragons like that. That just wasn't a thing, even though it should have been before then. It just it yeah. just wasn't a thing, you know. Because there's sure there's maybe some like older fantasy games before like that graphics quality was there. You know, yeah, ah, oh, it's so good. I might have to do a history of Elder Scrolls at some point. It's just so good. I would love oh, to hear that. <sighs> anyway, well, it's been a great episode. Oh, I gotta do this. So we got a couple new ratings this week. Big shout out to that. But I don't know if I ever gave our most recent review a shout out. So I want to do it. Maybe this is done twice. But uh, Dub Skates said, "Hanging out, very entertaining podcast. Feels like I'm hanging out and talking about video games!" Exclamation point. Thank you, Dub Skates. I don't know Thanks, if I Dub Skates shouted you out twice. I might have done that, but thank well, you for doing you that. You know what? Double shout out. Not the worst thing in the world. Yeah, but we're at 35 ratings now, and I'm really happy with that. And thank you so much for rating and reviewing. It means the world to us. You could also just tell your friends about the podcast. That means the world to us too. It does I don't want to speak out of turn, but maybe. If more people rated and reviewed the podcast, my cold would go away faster. Who knows? Can confirm. Good vibes always help. That's true. That's true. I'm like a plant. You know, when people would like to talk to their plants and then it would grow a little bit more. Was that scientific yep. study? 
That's great. Uh, if you want to email us, you can go to codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com. We're there. Tyler is on Twitter at sneakerelf with E-L-P-H, and I am on Twitter at me Coletta. And that's the plugs, I think, for the episode. Great we episode, Tyler. Gosh, I love Sonic so much. Me too. So so great. What a great episode. I'll talk to you all next week. Bye, Tyler. Bye, Mike. Bye.